Okay, on that lab that I just gave back, uh, a lot of you dinked up. It's a fairly simple question. It was uh, here was an inclined plane, and I said, "Hey, what would be the net force and the acceleration if you re if you removed friction?" Okay. Well. If you remove friction, the only force left acting on that system would be force parallel. Okay, let's say you, you have this thing sitting on an inclined plane. If you take away your friction and you take away your applied force, that's the only thing left in town is force parallel. So all you had to do, that, that net force, that's your net, that's it, it's force parallel. No, nothing else, there's no applied force and no friction, that's it. Then to get that acceleration, just take that force parallel and divide that, that by the mass, and you're going to get an acceleration to 4.9 meters per second squared. Okay? And a lot of you made this horribly, horribly, horribly complicated. I, 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 I don't even know what you did. But anyway, so don't make that complicated. Okay, so on the lab from Friday. So here's how right now this week is looking like it's going to play out. So we got projectile motion today and got a lab on that tomorrow. Next Tuesday, we'll review on Wednesday, and then your written final is going to be on Thursday. Okay? So if you want to plan ahead, that's kind of where we're at. All right. So here's the story. So you roll the ramp, you have the ramp, you rolled it down the hill, it turns into a projectile. So here's the key assumption that you're making. Is that what happens in the X stays in the X. And what happens in the Y stays in the Y. Okay? So the, the, we have two main assumptions. The first assumption is that there is no force acting in the horizontal direction. Because remember, if you, this harkens back to Newton's first law of motion. First law of motion says, hey, you don't exert a force on an object. Mother Nature was lazy prima donna. Mother Nature isn't going to change that velocity. Because Mother Nature, that's just easier for Mother Nature to do. Mother Nature goes, you want to change that velocity, that's going to require a force. And so once you launch that out, there is no force acting in the X direction. So without a force, Newton's first law says, hey, no force, no change in velocity. That's what allows us to use range <coughs> equals Vx time. Okay? Because we're assuming horizontally that that velocity is going to remain constant. So the range is just how far it goes, okay? That's it, just how far it goes. So you calculated the time, and that you should have used time equals the square root of 2d over g, and typically that time is around 0.4 seconds, okay? Depending on the height of the table, it's typically around 0.4 seconds. So you're going to know your time, you're going to know how far it went, that's going to allow you to calculate Vx. So take how far you went, divided by how long it's in the air, boom, there's your Vx. So that's key assumption number one. That what happens in the x stays in the x, and we're assuming that there's no forces in the x direction. Its inertia just keeps it moving. It's not going to accelerate. Vertically, there's a whole nother, that's a whole nother realm, okay? So vertically, you have the gravity mafia, which is pulling down. So as soon as it leaves the ramp, you no longer have the normal force. You still have gravity pulling down. And so this is where Newton's second law kicks in. Oh, Newton's second law is that big red sign that says F equals MA. Okay, well, that's kind of cool, right? So the force is going to be gravity pulling it down, the mass, and you know you're going to create an acceleration of 9.8 meters per second squared. So vertically we accelerate because there's an imbalanced force. Horizontally, we remain constant because there are no forces. Okay, so you know your acceleration. Now, the reason, and, and one of the key things that you want to look at is that what becomes a factor and what does not become a factor. Why didn't you all measure the mass of the marble? Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. You can't plug the mass of the marble into these equations if you try. Okay? It's not there. It's not there. Yeah. If I rolled a baseball down the ramp, would it weigh more? Yeah, but it's also going to have more mass. It's also going to have more inertia. 
but it's going to end up with the exact same acceleration. So if you used a bowling ball or if you used that little steel marble, none of the calculations would change because mass is not a factor, okay? And that's one of the key things you have to focus on. What's a factor in these calculations? What's important? What's not? Mass and marble doesn't matter. It's not there. Okay. Um, so when it does go flying off, and this is this question number five down below, oh, when it goes flying off, even though it's moving, there's only one force acting on it, and that's gravity. Well, because that's the only force acting on it, there's only one acceleration vector, and that's pointing downward. Now, don't confuse inertia with a force, okay? Inertia is not a force. There is no force pushing it that way once it leaves the table. It's not there, okay? It's not, inertia is not a force. Does it want to keep moving in that direction? Yes, but that's because it has inertia. But there's no horizontal forces going in that direction. Okay. Make sure on questions six and seven that I know exactly which one is which, which one is the rolled ball, which one is the drop ball, okay? Uh, on that back side, because the question number 1A is wrong, everything else is going to be a train wreck. So your answer to 1A should be a little bit less than two seconds, okay? Because if that's wrong, everything else is a train wreck. When you get down to that situation, I say if the horizontal velocity is doubled, how would each of the following change? And the same thing would happen if I double the height. You can do this one of two ways. You can do smash mouth physics and go back through and redo all the calculations and write down those numbers, okay? Or you can treat it mathematically and go, oh, it's going to double, it's going to increase by the square root of five, whatever you think, okay? But what you cannot do is you just cannot say, oh, it's going to increase or it's going to decrease or worse yet, it's going to be different or worse even yet, it's going to change. Okay, that's horrible, okay? More words in the English language than any other language and you get, it's going to be different. Okay, when you get down to question number two on that back side, all of your answers on all of the back side should have at least three significant digits. Okay, at least three. Let's say you have it hypothetically, you have an answer of 0.5. How many significant digits is that? One. Okay, one. I gave you really, really, really good data. Okay, don't cheat me on my answers. Okay, uh, now let's talk about question number four with the divers off the, in Acapulco. And these guys are nuts. You can actually video, do a YouTube search of these guys. So basically, here's these rocks. And these guys are going to run along and they're going to jump off the cliff. Okay? So you know how far they're going to fall, which is about 41 meters. Now, here's where these problems go south. The math isn't that complicated. Typically what happens is when you guys screw it up is because you put the X in the wrong place and the Y and you switch that up. When in doubt, make a simple sketch and go, hey, you know, where, 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 where are my dimensions? Which is, which is in the X and which is in the Y? So here's 12 meters, okay? Now 12 meters is a fairly decent step. 12 meters is about from like that wall to that wall. So they've got, they've, they've got to get out there quite a ways. But they're also falling 41 meters. Now, to give, give you some perspective, this ceiling is just two and a half meters tall. So imagine falling 41 meters, okay? That's a long way to fall. And you're going to be going really, really, really fast when you hit the water. If you do this, don't do a belly flop, okay? Very bad things are going to happen. You are going to probably be knocked unconscious because you're going to slow down so rapidly when you're in that water. Anyway, so your answer to number four should be around four meters per second. I wish I was clever and I planned that out. I didn't. It's a random thing. So you need to be going at least four meters per second. Okay, that's an ish, but it's something around four. So if you're not going at least four, bad things are going to happen. Okay, you will make that mistake one time 
and one time only, and you will never live to make that mistake again. So now, if you do the math, thankfully it wasn't like 10 meters per second, because if you needed to be going 10 meters per second, oh, you'd have to be a world-class sprinter to do this, okay? But if there's anything to go for, it's like, I am, I am old, I could run four meters per second. So this is doable, but you're just not going to stand on the edge of the cliff and just jump and do this. No, you'd have to be running and then go forward and then hope that there isn't like, hopefully you don't encounter like a strong headwind when you get off that cliff. Like, oh man, headwind, this is not going to end well. Anyway. Um, your answers on number three, both of those, this is an ish, should be around seven. Uh, and your answer to number five would make a horrible GPA. Anything else you want me to go over on that? At all? Going once, going twice. So, so get that hint in there. Stop down the camera, please. Okay, so here's what's going to be the same but yet different from what we've done before. So, what we talked about on Friday in the lab meeting that you did is that something is going to get launched out and you're just going to throw this thing horizontally. The key assumption that was made is that your initial vertical velocity is going to equal zero meters per second. Okay, that's the key assumption that we're going to make, is that it goes exactly horizontally. Okay, there is no vertical velocity. And that made it sweet, because then we could go, oh, you know, you looked at distance equals one-half at squared plus v naught time. Okay, and again, what happens in the x stays in the x. What happens in the y stays in the y. So, even though it had a horizontal velocity, my initial vertical velocity is going to be zero. That's what it allows us to go, oh, 2D over A and take the square root of that. Oh, that's how we got time. We looked at V squared equals V naught squared plus 2AD. My initial vertical velocity was zero. We dropped that out. Hey, life was simple, okay? Now, most projectile motion isn't like that. Most projectile motion is actually ground to ground. You hit a golf ball, you hit a volleyball, you shoot a basket, okay? You hit a softball, and you're trying to hit a home run, okay? Most projectile motion isn't like this. Most projectile motion is going to, you're going to start with some initial vertical velocity. But it's going to be the same idea. So let's say that we're going to launch a softball. Carson, so pick a number between... 20 and 60? Um, 42. What'd you say? 42. Okay. So we're going to hit a softball at 42 degrees. Uh, Bailey, pick a number between 20 and 40. 35. At 35 meters per second. Okay. So here's the story. We're going to launch a softball at 42 degrees with a velocity of 35.0 meters per second. So that would be like me take. Hector, can you catch? Okay. So here's the situation. So I'm going to throw this like this. You ready? Okay. So we're going to have, as that thing takes off, here's what's going to be important. It's going to have a horizontal component to the velocity. That's what allowed it to get the vector. Or to Hector. Hector. Hector vector. And so then we had a horizontal vector velocity, and then we're going to have a vertical velocity as well. So throw that back. So as that's going through the arrow, the first thing that we have to do is find our Vx and Vy. Now here's what's going to be, immediately here's what's different. Immediately, the difference is that now we have initial vertical velocity that we didn't have if it was a limbing problem. Okay, so that's the biggest change that we have to have. So, MLM, I know the 35 meters per second is like the hypotenuse, and I know the angle. So, how am I going to find how am I going to find that initial vertical velocity? 
And I know the angle. Let me give you a hint. It's one of the trig functions. Um, I know that. They're beautiful. So this is going to be the sine of... So somebody take sine of 42 degrees times 35 meters per second. What'd you get? 23.42. 23.4 meters per second. Make sure that you are in degree mode and not weird radian mode coming out of a pre-calc class. Okay? So, MLN, if I use sine to get VY, what am I going to use to get VX? Cosine. Beautiful. So my VX is going to be the cosine of... 42 degrees times 35 meters per second. So, Carson, run those numbers, please. 26.0. Okay, now, here's the deal. You get a problem like this. This is the first thing that you do. You break it up into your VX and your vertical components, and then you never, ever speak of that 35 meters per second again, okay? It is dead to you, okay? Never speak of it again. It is a gateway vector that allows you to find Vx and Vy. Once you get Vx and Vy marked through that 35 meters per second, do not ever use it again, okay? It is dead to you. Do not use it again. Stop. Put it away. File it away. Boom. Now, right now, I want you to all to pretend like this problem doesn't exist, okay? It's gone. And we're getting ready for the acceleration test. And I'm going to launch the ball straight up at 23.4 meters per second, okay? You know nothing about projectile motion. You've never heard of this before. You have never heard of forces, Newton's laws, nothing. You're just getting ready for the acceleration test, okay? And I'm going to launch the ball straight up at 23.4 meters per second. So I want to find the time up. I want to find the time down. I want to find the maximum height. And I want to figure out how fast it's going at one second. And I want to figure out how high it is at one second. Okay, I know one number, 23.4 meters per second. I want to find the time up, the time down, the maximum height, how fast it's going and how high it is at one second into its flight. So, Adon, what else do I know? Which is going to be what? Beautiful. We're on this strange rock, and we have a pretty strong gravitational field, so we know our acceleration. Not applied, but written. Okay? Uh, on the time up, when it reaches this maximum height, what's the final velocity going to be, Jaden? Zero. Zero. So when it reaches this maximum height, my velocity is going to equal zero meters per second. So Connor, since my initial velocity is 23.4 and I want to go to zero and my acceleration is negative 9.8 meters per second squared, is my time up going to be more or less than one second? More. Why? Because it's greater than 9.8. Beautiful. Okay. So I know my time up has to be more than one second because my velocity is more than 9.8 meters per second. Okay. So what can I do to find my time up? Tyler, what can I do? Um, well you, you can plug that into the equation, right? Can I can. Which one? So. I know my initial velocity, my final velocity, my acceleration, and I'm trying to find time. You could use uh, velocity final equals velocity initial plus AP. Perfect. Okay. 
So I can use V equals V naught plus AT. It's a linear function. Know your acceleration changes as a linear function of time because we have a uniform acceleration. So if we solve this thing for time, we can go V minus V naught over A is going to equal time. So I can take 0 minus 23.4 meters per second divided by negative 9.8 meters per second squared. So Carson, do us a favor. Take 23.4 and divide that by 9.8. Okay, now that matches with what Connor said it should be. Connor said, hey, it should be more than a second, and it is, okay? And if, and if, you, if gravity was a little bit stronger, the acceleration due to gravity would actually be like negative 10, and we'll get into this later, so we could either shrink the Earth or make it a little bit more massive, and G would have been negative 10. So if you take 23.4 and divide it by 10, you get a ballpark of 2.34, uh, hey, we're at 2.38. Hey, that makes sense mathematically. Okay. So, Devon World Wide Web. If my time up is 2.38 seconds, what do you think my time down is going to be? Uh, 2.38 seconds? Yeah. So, this is going to be a key assumption. This is going to be a key assumption, especially on projectile motion. If the ball returns back to the same height, <coughs> then you can assume that the time up is the same as the time down, and this is symmetrical. Okay, you can do that, it's cool, right? But what you can't do is let's say that you're up on top of a cliff and it goes something like this, okay, where you're gonna fall, like if, if I'm up here on a cliff, and I do this, and that ball is going to fall all the way down to the ground, then you can't do that. But if it starts here, I was going to need like a torch thing. Needs what? Need like a torch thing, a lighter. Yeah. For a test tube for coming through. I don't have it. Yeah. Huh? Okay. So does she just need like a, like a, she needs like a lighter. Like, like a striker? Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> I don't have any. Okay. Yeah, I, I all I have is just a, like a striker and like a propane torch, or like like the Bunsen burners. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll let her know. Okay. If she needs that, I got her. But yeah. okay. 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 So if you go from here to here, and the same, and it's the same time up, time down, exact same. But if I do this and it falls all the way down like that, can't do it, okay? Or if I throw it, and then I catch it up here, times aren't the same. So if it returns back to that same height, and that's a huge if, if it returns back to the same height, you can just set it up as being symmetrical. So, if my time up is 2.38 seconds, and my time down is 2.38 seconds, Jack, how can I find my total time? Time, you can just add the times. Yeah, if I take 2.38 plus 2.38 or multiply that together, so my total time then is going to be uh, 5.76 seconds. I might be off my mental math, but I think that's right. Okay, so total time is going to be 5.76 seconds. Got that? Now, let's talk about max height. Let's find max height without using time. So how can I find, Miss Elliot, my max height without using time? Um, v squared equals V naught squared plus two. Fantastic. Okay. V squared equals V naught squared plus 2AD. Old school. Okay. You know your initial velocity, you know your final velocity, you don't know D. So if I go V squared minus V naught squared over 2A, I get my distance, so I get 0 squared minus 23, 
9.4 meters per second squared divided by 2 times negative 9.8 meters per second squared. Carson, 23.4 squared divided by 19.6. 27.94. So 27.9 meters. Okay? Now, that's one way that you can do this. Okay? The beauty of this is that it doesn't rely on time. The other way that you could do this is that you could use distance equals one half at squared plus v naught time. You, a lot of times you do have to use this particular equation when you're in projectile motion, because a lot of times you want to figure out like how high that ball is as a function of time. So let's say for one of the things we'll do tomorrow is that we'll look at, hey, you know, Carson hits a softball and we know how far out the, the outfield fence is and we know how high that, that fence is and then we can calculate the height of that ball to see does it like hit the wall or does it clear the wall. And the only way you can do that is this. So this is a cool equation. It's just a function equation. It gives you height as, as a function of time, okay? So if you were a math nerd, they would write that as Fy equals one-half at squared plus uh, some value of velocity in the y times time. Okay, so if you're in a, in a math class, they're going to try and look fancy. You go, ooh, look at us, okay? But then they never put in the units, and they randomly put down numbers, and you have no idea what they mean, but anyway. So this is just a function equation. So the other thing that you could do is that you could plug in negative 9.8 meters per second squared, and you could plug in that time when it's at its maximum height of 2.38 seconds, squared plus that initial velocity of 23.4 meters per second times 2.38 seconds. Now, when you do this, and you will have to do this, okay, what you have to be careful of is that this has to be a negative 9.8 meters per second squared. This has to be negative 9.8 meters per second squared. And this is only the vertical component of the velocity, okay? It is, all, again, because it's only the vertical component of that velocity that's affected by a gravitational field, okay? So when you do this in projectile motion, this has to be a negative number, and this has to only be the initial vertical velocity, not the overall launch velocity, not the Vx, just the vertical component of the velocity because it happens in the y stays in the y. So if you did that, you'd plug that in, you'd still get 27.9 meters, okay? This is, this is more complicated than doing that equation. It works, but it's more complicated. Okay. So that's another option that you could do. So one problem left, we need to figure out the height and the velocity at one second. So here's what we know. This thing was launched straight up at 23.4 meters per second. And I want to figure out how fast it's going and how high it is at one second. Okay, now let's think this through. At one second, at one second, is he? Is the ball still going to be on its way up or, or is it going to be on its way down? How do you know? You're right, but how do you know? It's because the time up is 2.38, so it hasn't been that. Fantastic, okay? So the total time, the maximum height is 2.38 seconds. We're only one second into this thing, so I know my velocity still has to be positive because it hasn't reached its maximum height yet, okay? So, Izzy, since we started down this road with you, how would you recommend that we find the velocity one second into this deal? Um, we have time, we have, we don't have distance yet. Don't have distance yet. So, could we do v equals, v equals at? We could. It's a linear function, okay? If you know you want to go old school and you lock on a velocity time graph, there you are, 23.4 meters per second. The slope of this line is going to be negative 9.8 meters per second squared. 
we know it's going to take 2.38 seconds for that velocity to cross zero. So we're trying to figure out how high it is that, or that velocity at one second. Don't get wrapped up and just go, oh, this is physics. This is hard, okay? This is a slope intercept form in a mathematical equation. Your y intercept is 23.4 meters per second. There's the slope. You're trying to find the corresponding y value with an x value of 1, okay? It looks cool and it sounds cool because it has like a real life application. Oh, how high is it? Oh, okay. Or what's its velocity? Okay? It's the same idea. All we're finding is a matching x and y coordinate system. Okay? That's all we're finding is what's the velocity that matches with an x component at 1. Okay? So there's a couple of things that you know before you even calculate the velocity. You know it has to be less than 23.4 meters per second, and it has to be greater than zero, okay? Because it hasn't reached its maximum height, and it's slowing down. So if I get an answer bigger than 23.4, which would be really, really weird, or if I get a negative number, I know I've done something wrong, okay? So all this is is a slope intercept. It is literally, here's your y-intercept, 23.4 meters per second plus negative 9.8 meters per second squared times the time of one second. So the basically, if you want, if you're into financial analogies, mom and dad have dropped you off at Target, Walmart, whatever. You have $23.40. Mom and dad say you have to spend one you have to spend $9.80 for every second that you're in the store. You show up and you have $23.40. One second later, you would have spent $9.80. Say $23.4, subtract $9.80, that's how much money you have left over. Okay? The 2.38 seconds, that's how long it's going to take for you to go broke. That's, at that point, you will have no money left spending money at $9.80 per second, okay? So if you like a monetary analysis, that's it. So basically, the short version is, take 23.4 and subtract 9.8. So Carson, what do you get if you take 23.4 and subtract 9.8? 13.6. 13.6? Yeah. Meters per second. Okay. Now, if you're on the position time graph, oh, let's go old school. If you're at the position time graph, how does that 13.6 match and play out with that one second mark? How does that 13.6 match and play a factor on the position time graph? Hector. Let me give you a hint. It rhymes with angent line. Beautiful. So the slope of that tangent line at one second is going to be 13.6 meters per second. Because what does the slope of a tangent line give you on a position time graph? I'm going to give you a hint. It rhymes with instantaneous velocity. Instantaneous velocity. So at one second, you are traveling at 13.6 meters per second. You draw the tangent line. That's what that slope is going to be. So at time, at 2.38 seconds, guess what? So that tangent line is going to be zero. zero because that's when you're changing direction. After that point, you're going to have negative values. Okay. So we got that. So now we know how fast we're going. Now we need to answer, Now we need to ask the Colorado question. How high are you at one second? So, there's the only one, one way you can do that. And that's to do this. Okay, that is the only way you can find this answer. Okay, that is it. There is no other way. Zip, zero, none, the zip. So, you just have to plug in one half. Negative 9.8 meters per second squared. You're going to put in one second. 
And then you're going to have 23.4 meters per second times one second. Now, your maximum height, we said, was, what was our maximum height? 27.9. So clearly, my answer has to be less than 27.9. If I get an answer bigger than 27.9, I've done something horribly wrong. So, basically, you're going to take 23.4 and you're going to subtract 4.9. And you're going to get 19 or 18 something. 18.5. 18.5 meters, okay? So that's how high you are at one second. So on your position time graph, there's a couple of things that I could ask you. I could say, okay, hey, at one second, what's your height? Oh, that's gonna be 18 and a half meters. Oh, at one second, if you were to draw a tangent line, what would the slope of the tangent line be? Oh, that's gonna be 13.6 meters per second. So one second I can figure out two things. I can figure out the slope of the tangent line, which is going to be my instantaneous velocity. I can also know exactly what the value of that height is at one second. And I can plug in any value of time in here and get that height, and I can also get that instantaneous velocity. Cool, got that, we're good. Okay, now, here's the big picture. Now, I want you to visualize two things. you, you got to visualize this. Situation number one, Adana is going to throw a ball straight up at 23.4 meters per second. Okay, so Adana's here. She's going to throw this ball straight up, 23.4 meters per second. At the exact same time, Devon Worldwide Win is going to hit a golf ball at an angle of whatever that was way back when we started this whole thing. Uh, at 35 meters per second at 42 degrees. Okay? So imagine this. Adana throws the ball straight up like this. Devin hits the ball with a golf club, and it's going like this, okay? So this is our action. This, straight up. Now, here's the whole key to this. You have to look at what the gravity mafia can influence. The gravity mafia cannot touch the horizontal velocity. The gravity mafia cannot touch the 35 meters per second. The only thing the gravity mafia can affect is the 23.4 meters per second. That's the only thing that it can influence because what happens in the Y stays in the Y, what happens in the X stays in the X, okay? So here's the cool thing, is that if we could do this, if Anna throws it straight up, Devin hits it at, 23, at, at 35 meters per second at an angle of 42 degrees. What you would see is that both of those would hit the exact same maximum height at the exact same time. Both of them would take, whatever that time was, 2.38 seconds to reach the maximum height, okay? The, it's the exact same. You could not tell the difference between the two of them. They are both going to reach the exact same maximum height. So if you could do like a stop motion kind of thing and look at each golf ball or baseball and you could look at them at different times and you could draw a line across there they would be the exact same height at the exact same point in time okay everything is going to stay the same gravity cannot tell the difference between the two of them because gravity can only influence the vertical motion they're both going to reach the exact height at the exact same time now Are they both going to have, Peyton, the exact same vertical acceleration? Yes. And which direction is that going to point? Well, 
straight down. So here's the story. If you were to draw acceleration vectors, they would both have the exact same acceleration vector of 9.8 meters per second squared. Okay. Now here's the only difference, and I'm going to draw the I'm going to draw the golf ball one separately. Okay. So when it takes off, it's going to have some horizontal velocity, which we said was what was that vx component way way back up here, 26 meters per second. Okay. So it's going to have. A horizontal velocity of 26 meters per second. Now, as it flies through the air with the greatest of ease, what's going to happen to that VX component? Carson, what's going to happen to that VX as it flies through the air? Start to slow down. No, 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 no. So my horizontal velocity. What do we assume about our horizontal velocity? It's just constant. Stays the same. So no matter where you are, even at the top, that VX is not going to change. That's going to stay the same throughout the entire flight. It's going to start at 23.4 meters per second. Now, as it goes up, as it goes up, Bailey Martin, what's going to happen to that 23.4 meter per second vertical velocity? Increase, decrease, stay the same. What's going to happen when it lands? When that golf ball gets launched, yeah. it's going to start with a vertical component of 23.4 meters per second. Mm -hmm. Okay? What's going to happen to that vertical velocity as the ball goes up? Increase, decrease, stay the same. Increase. Huh? So it's going to go faster vertically as it goes up. Oh, no, it's going to be Okay, yeah, Gra gravity tends to, tends to slow it down, okay? This is like the anti-gravity ball, which would be really weird, okay? So my, velo my vertical velocity is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller. When it reaches its maximum height, what's my vertical velocity? Zero. But I'm still moving because I have a horizontal velocity. So even though my vertical velocity goes to zero, I'm still moving because I have a horizontal component of that velocity. Bailey Martin, when it starts to fall, what happens to my vertical velocity? That gets bigger and it changes sign. So now I have negative vertical velocity, which is gonna get bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay, cool, got that. Now. As it flies through the air, there's only one acceleration vector. And which direction does that acceleration vector point? Connor. Down. Straight down. There is one acceleration vector, and that always points straight down. Now, a cool thing happens at the top. At the top, and this is the only place this happens, your acceleration vector is at right angles to your velocity vector. Because the only velocity vector that you have at the top is horizontal, and your acceleration vector is pointing straight down. So up at the top, that's the only place that acts to be at a 90 degrees. Now, the other thing that you need to understand is the terminology about speed. So when you talk about projectile motion, you talk about speed. So if this ball was launched at whatever it was, what was that initial velocity? Uh, 35 meters per second, okay? So this ball is launched with a speed of 35 meters per second. So in other words, imagine that you could have like a radar gun and you could pick up the speed of that ball right as it leaves, right as it leaves the club. So it's going to launch with the speed of 35 meters per second. It's going to land over here, oddly enough, also with the speed of 35 meters per second. But here's what you have to be careful of. Even though it's going to land with the same, same speed, it doesn't land with the same velocity in the sense that it's going to land with a vertical velocity of negative 23.4 meters per second, because that was my vertical 
velocity here. So it's going to land with a vertical velocity of negative 23.4. It's still going to have that same horizontal component. So if you were to draw that resultant, that speed would still be the 35 meters per second. So when you talk about speed in projectile motion, you're talking about the resultant of the x and y components, okay? And because that's just a, that's just a scalar quantity, you, all you have to give is just the number, okay? So here's the main idea. When you get projectile motion problems, kind of summarize everything, okay? You're going to be given a launch velocity, some number, and you're going to be given an angle. So here's the first thing that you do. You find your VY using the launch velocity times the sine of the angle. You find your VX using the launch velocity times the cosine of the angle. Okay? That's what you do. And as soon as you do that, as soon as you get those numbers, you never speak of that overall launch velocity again. It is not your vertical component. It's not your horizontal component. It's not your VY. Boom. So as soon as you use that as a gateway value to get your VY and your VX, never speak of your launch velocity again. It is dead to you. Okay? It is dead to you. Don't use it. Okay? Use it to find VX. Use it to find VY. And then you step away from that value and never use it again. Okay? Because it's not what's going to happen. It's only your vertical component. Now, a funny thing happens. Could I use that equation, this distance equals one half at squared plus v naught time? Could I use that to find the range of the ball? So if you go back to the fact that this ball was in the air a total time of, what was our total time? Whatever that was. 2.38 times 2. 5 point something. Could I use this to find my range? If I know the total time that it's in the air. Connor. Yeah. Why? Because you have an initial velocity and your start from zero, so it's just equal to you two. Fantastic. You can use this equation because horizontally, and that's exactly what Connor said, horizontally, what's my acceleration? Zero. Zero. That whole thing drops out. Oh, we get V naught time. We have distance equals velocity times time. We can use this equation even to find our range. We're just going to repackage it and call it VX time. So if I want to know how far this softball is going to go that Carson hit, I'm going to take my horizontal velocity, which we said was 26.0 meters per second, and then I'm going to multiply that by the total time, okay? Because that's how long it's going to be in the air. Oh, my total time. I'll time up. So what was it, 2.38? 2.3867, 5.76. So, Carson, take 26 times 5.76, please. 149.7. So, 149.8 meters. About 150 meters. That's a decent shot, okay? That'd be like a football field and a half, right? Football field is about 100 meters, okay? That'd be a pretty decent, pretty decent distance to hit a, you know, hit a ball. About 150 meters. Okay, got it? Good? Grand? Okay. <sighs> Stop that, please. Okay, so let me kind of get you started on some of these problems. So, with spring season, we'll talk about baseball. So, here's the pitcher, okay, and here's the catcher. Okay, so imagine this, you're going to throw two different baseballs, 
Situation number one, you're going to throw the baseball and horizontally, okay? So it's going to be like a limiting problem. So you're going to throw the ball horizontally, boom, pretty quick, and it's going to get to the catcher. Situation number two, you're going to throw the ball. It's still going to be a limiting problem, but then you're not going to throw it as fast, okay? You're still going to throw it. You're just not going to throw it as fast. In both situations, the ball is going to make it to the catcher, okay? So don't tell me, oh, the faster ball is going to go further. This is no. They are both going to make it to the catcher, okay? They're both going to be caught. The question is, is that why is the ball that's thrown faster, why is that going to be more likely to be in the strike zone and the ball that's thrown slower going to be more likely to be below the strike zone. So let me give you a hint. Look at it in terms of time, okay? Look at it in terms of the gravity mafia. Which one is going to have longer or more time for the gravity mafia to act on it, okay? So do not, do not, do not tell me, oh, the faster ball is going to go further. No, no, no. Look at it in terms of time. Okay. When you get to question number two, listen to me. Listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. You have a Teflon puck moving on a frictionless surface. Okay. And listen to me. The puck is already moving. Okay. You don't have to push it. It's already been pushed, okay? So imagine that you're viewing this hockey puck as it's moving along this table, okay? It's already moving. Do not push it, okay? Do not push it. It's already moving. It's friction of the surface. I've given you the mass of the hockey puck, 0 0.10 kilograms, okay? About a tenth of a, of a kilogram, okay? And it's already moving. So what you want to draw first is the forces that are acting on it. You're going to choose a scale, okay? Like maybe one centimeter equals a newton, something like that. So you're going to figure out what forces are acting on this thing in two different positions. When it's up on the table, and then as it's falling through the air. Now, when you get to this one, and I put little asterisks there, it has not hit the ground but it's just about to. Like, you could just slide a piece of paper underneath there, okay? It hasn't hit the ground, but it's just about to, okay? So, you're going to set up a scale, maybe like one centimeter equal newton, something like that. I don't care. But you're going to pick a scale, say this is what's going to happen. You're going to draw it in all four situations. Now, when you get to B, now you're going to draw your acceleration vectors. So your acceleration vectors are going to be driven by your force vectors. So if you look at the force vectors up above, and all the forces cancel out, they add up equal to zero, what's your acceleration vector going to be? Zero. There won't be one. So look at your force vectors up above. If your force vectors add up equal to zero, you don't have an acceleration. If your force vectors don't add up to equal to zero, then you're going to have an acceleration in the direction of that net force. Okay? Boom, there you go. Now, when you get to C, now you're going to draw your velocity vectors. So the puck is already moving at 5 meters per second. So that's its horizontal velocity, 5 meters per second. So to determine if your velocity vectors are going to change, look at your acceleration vectors. If you don't have an acceleration vector, Guess what? Your velocity vectors aren't going to change. If you do have an acceleration vector, your velocities are going to change. And if you're going to determine if you have an acceleration vector, jump back up to the force vectors. Oh, right, my force vectors add up to equal to zero. Oh, I don't have an acceleration vector. I'm not going to change that velocity. Oh, I have an unbalanced force. Oh, I have an acceleration vector. Then I'm going to change my velocity. So what you want to do is look at this in terms of distance. So on the first one, 
it's falling 0.6 meters, and the second one it's falling 1.2 meters. Let me give you a hint. The easiest thing you can do is assume that it starts at zero each time. First situation, you start at zero, vertical velocity, and it's falling 0.6 meters. Second one, you start at zero, and it's falling 1.2 meters. Okay, that's the easiest way to look at that. Okay, on the back side, three and four are relating to the question about the hockey puck. On number five, here's the situation. You're going to hit a golf ball at 32 meters per second at an angle of 30 degrees. Peyton, what's the first thing I'm going to do with that vector and that angle? I'm going to find VX, and I'm going to find VY. And then what am I going to do with that 32 meters per second? Get rid of it, okay? Put an X through it. Don't use it again, okay? Use that 32 meters per second to find your VX, and you find your VY. And then never speak of that again. It is dead to you, okay? Now, on number six, it's the same situation. But now, we're going to launch it at a 60 degree angle. So still at 32 meters per second, you're going to find your VX, find your VX, VY, never speak to the 32 meters per second again. Now, when you get to question number eight, so let me paint you this picture on question number eight. Here's this cliff, 20 meters tall. You're going to hit a golf ball, and it's going to go something like this okay and you're at 40 meters per second at an angle of 60 degrees okay first thing you're going to do is you're going to do the Peyton move you're going to find your VX you're going to find your VY and never speak about 40 meters per second again now you want to find a whole bunch of things this is like if you hearken back to the acceleration test and remember you all had that ball off the off the building problem, okay? Shot it up in the air, boom, came back down. Same type idea. You need to find the maximum height. Remember, you are starting 20 meters above the ground. You need to find the time, and that time is going to have two different values. You got to find your time up, and then you have to find your time down, okay? Embrace the idea that distance equals one half at squared plus v naught time. Now, remember, on the way down, okay, on the way down, when it starts to fall, what's the initial vertical velocity? When it starts to fall, what's your initial vertical velocity? Mm. Zero. So on the way down, it, if you think about it, on the way down, it becomes like a lemming problem, okay? So if you can figure out what happens to get to that maximum height, once you get to that maximum height, then it becomes a lemming problem. Oh, my VX stays the same. I know how far it's going to fall. I can use this to figure out how long it's in the air, and I can use that equation to figure out how fast it's going to be going when it lands. So here's what you're ultimately after. Okay? What you're ultimately after in this entire problem is when this thing lands, it's going to have a VX component, and it's going to have a VY component, and you're trying to find that speed, which is that hypotenuse. Now, let me give, this is what I want you to think through. It's going to launch here with some vertical velocity, 20 meters above the ground. It's going to start with some VY. It's going to land over here with a VY. So here's my question. If you were to compare that VY to that VY, is this VY here when it lands going to be bigger or smaller than the VY when it took off? Emmeline? Smaller? Bigger? Bigger, because it's going to fall further, right? If it, when it crosses this point, 20 meters above the ground, that vertical velocity there is going to be the exact same. But it's going to fall an additional 20 meters. So when you get this VY here, there's just a little self-check that you can do. This VY here has to be bigger than that initial ver vertical velocity that you have there because it's falling farther. 
There, it's going to launch at 40 meters per second. Because it's going to fall all the way down here, do you think the speed when it lands here is going to be bigger or smaller than the speed when it's launched? Bigger. Bigger. So what you should see is that when you get that speed value on, on D, that has to be bigger than 40 meters per second because it's like this. You're here, you're launching it, and then it's going to fall all the way down to the ground. So your VUI has to be bigger than when you launched it, and your speed has to be bigger than when you launched it. Okay? If it's not, you violated some laws of physics. Okay, I'm done. You're on your own. Stop that.